you know, whatever. It's very easy to allow yourself to become routine by phrases without really understanding and embracing the consequence and the depth of the phrases that you speak. I've jotted down a couple of things here. All things work together for good. That's a fr phrase that we all know. Pastor Frank used to say that nearly every Sunday when he gave a talk. By his stripes we are healed. We've mentioned that already. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Another phrase that we, we sometimes grab hold of, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, whether we're going to do something or whether we can go somewhere or whatever, we, we tend to say, God willing. Who, who's ever heard that? A person says, oh, God willing. You know, and, and the thing is that sometimes we, we, we forget to understand that God has given us free will. And see, some of these statements can be a little bit sort of a little bit disconcerting or not accurate. We go to funerals and we'll say things to make ourselves say, feel better about the circumstance of that person passing away or whatever it is that God took him or her. And these statements can, can be a little bit awkward and, and not quite accurate. You know, God is not in the business of taking people's lives, if you really think about it. We can live our lives surrounded by phrases without ever really connecting to what they mean. And that's what that, this talk about is today. We can know what to say, when to say, even how to say it, as I mentioned with hospital visits. We can admire the faith of others because we see and hear what they say. Yet do they necessarily do? And that is part of what we're talking about today. We can consume wisdom for years and still be spiritual novices because we haven't necessarily connected to the meaning. We haven't understood that the word made flesh is within. And this is one of those things, and I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, that the Apostle Paul became very aware of. It's more than words. It's, it's the understanding. It's the innateness of faith. It is what the intent of heart is. This is what matters more than you being able to quote a phrase or say something and not necessarily connect to its meaning it's a big it's a big topic this we're going to uh, start reading here in first corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1 this is the apostle paul and i brethren when i came to you came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of god for i determined not to know anything among you save jesus christ and him crucified and the apostle paul expounded on that often he understood that what matters most is what christ did and what he achieved and the miracle of salvation that he's engineered and put into us and it says here and i was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling i was doing my best i was trying to to, to step outside phrases and meanings and, and come to understand what it truly means to be a son or daughter of the living God. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And I guess in a sense, if you look at the world of religion, and if you have a look at traditional churches, even perhaps charismatic churches, we're all saying the same sentences. We're all sort of saying, yeah, by his stripes we are healed. But it's understanding what they mean. It's absorbing it. It's praying through the understanding and embracing the fact, as we're going to read later on. It says in our scripture there that Abraham was a friend of God. And that's, a, that's quite a profound thing to be able to say. We can come to church year after... Oh, I was going the other way. Minute, hour, year 
on it goes for decades. And then you find yourself in hospital and the diagnosis isn't good. And you've got, you've got this, this, this kind of message that by his stripes we are healed. Then all of a sudden, you're grappling, trying to understand what that means and how it works. It's a conundrum. See, we shouldn't wait till the moments come. We should pray ourselves to know our Creator. We should be able to say that we are friends with God. He is our best bestie. He is our saviour. We know him. So that when the times come that are difficult, we're not just hanging our hat or, or our mindset or whatever it is on a sentence. We've moved beyond that. And as we're going to read in a moment, this is, called, this, this is a level, and it's not a level without this is a level within. This is us understanding why Jesus died on the cross. This is understanding how that came to be. And how it came to be that, that you and I are sons and daughters of the living God. We've been baptized into his knowledge. We've been baptized into knowing what the words mean. And they're words of power. They're words of fire. They're not just phrases. Because the words that you and I know, that perhaps the scriptures that, that we have marked in our Bible, are marked in the Bible of people that are unsaved. They're marked in the Bibles of people all over the world and they haven't got what you've got. They haven't got the Holy Spirit within. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained. We've read that bit already which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I've always thought that that is something to come. I don't think that anymore. Maybe that's now. Maybe that's your realisation Maybe that's you really understanding what it means to be a son or daughter of the living God. Maybe that's you in, in your prayer life and in the moments when, you, you know, when we gather and take communion. There, there needs to be, in a sense, like a transition from words to reality. And we're going to read about that transition here. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, the deep, things of God for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of the man which is in him even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God which things also we speak not in words not in words which man's wisdom teaches everybody's saying the same thing Everybody's using the same words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is said all over the world, every Sunday. But it's not about the words. It's about understanding what the words mean. And further to that, you know, and we're going to read this in a moment if we have time. The word of God talks about being doers of the word. Actions. It goes on here. Which things also we speak not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." And all the people said, you know, you can, uh, you can be bound by theology rather than inspiration. You can be bound by ideas rather than insight. Let's turn to Luke 12. In verse 1.
This is kind of a hard-hitting expose by Jesus on the need for us to commit ourselves. In the, in the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, in so much that they trod upon another. That means they were crowd surfing for those in the youth or whatever. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. This is people that speak words of no substance. This is people who say things and don't understand what it means. And it goes on, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever that ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, that ye have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. This is talking about us realizing that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are totally and absolutely exposed to the Lord. He's working in us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So what we have to do is, is take that step, I guess, into the glorious void and give ourselves over and transition beyond religion. Transition into the Holy Spirit. Therefore, whatsoever, I've read that bit, I say unto you, this is verse 4, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after have no more what they can do. For I, I forewarn you whom ye sh shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto him, fear him. This is talking about the things that matter. This is not talking about religion. This is not talking about turning up. This is not talking about just, just being kind because there's kind people everywhere. What this is talking about is the matters of life and death. This is about the Holy Spirit versus Satan. This is about the pull of that and the need for us to move in close. The need for us to understand that the Holy Spirit casts away all of the dross and allows you to, to have this wonderful liberty, this wonderful understanding you know, some people have received the Holy Spirit amongst us, me too, and, and, and you pride yourself that you go to all the Sunday meetings, you go to the Wednesday meetings, you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that, and you do that, but they wouldn't cross the road to help a brother or sister or a person in need. Because what's happened there is the words have just remained words. They're not real. There's no understanding of what it means to represent the Holy Spirit, to represent the power of God, to represent the change in you, that you now are special, a chosen generation. You've been called out to a different understanding. 1 John 3. Very quiet in here today. I'll, I'll be quiet so you can talk. Sorry about that. Yep. Okay, what have we got? Um, 1 John 3, verse 16. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and he ought to lay down our eyes for our, our eyes, not our eyes, our lives for our, the brethren. But whosoever has this, his world's good and seeth his brother hath need and shutteth up his bowels and compassion from him, now how God dwelleth the love of God in. Now, this is what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read you this, this passage from uh, verse uh, 18 through to 21 in the Amplified Bible. And it, as I've said in the past, it just turns the volume up a little bit. Little children, let us love not merely in theory or in speech, but in deed and in truth in practice and in sincerity. By this we shall come to know, perceive, recognize and understand that we are of the truth and can reassure, quiet, conciliate and pacify our hearts in his presence. Whenever our hearts in tormenting self-accusation make us feel guilty and condemn us, for we are in God's hands, for he is above and greater than our consciences, our hearts, 
and he knows and perceives and understands everything. Nothing is hidden from him. And beloved, if our consciences, our hearts, do not accuse us, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, we have confident, complete assurance and boldness before God. Now, that probably was a lot of words, and it was. But the key to what I just read out then, it's the Amplified Bible, as I said, is listen to your heart. Because the heart, that small voice in you, when you've received the Holy Spirit, that little conscience thing, is the barometer. It, it is knowing God. It is understanding God. It is stepping up a level. And it's very important that if we listen to our heart, and I'm not talking about that that beats, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit heart in us. It unlocks the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It allows you to see things the way he saw things. It opens up the vision of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It makes you understand that agape love is not just a word. Agape love is his wide open embrace. It's the understanding of how it will end and how the world will be fixed and what your job is and what your role is. And our role doesn't just start at the Lord's return. The word of God says that we, we meet with him now. We've been called into heavenly places. We are members of the household of God now. And the only way we can really embrace this and understand it is to step outside the metaphors, to step outside the words and step into the love and the embrace of the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful thing. James 1 verse 22. Do you know I talk too much? I can't believe it's 10 to 3. Okay, James 1 verse 22. You know this verse. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. And here's, here's the, the thing. Deceiving your own selves. It's, it's kind of like you, you've got a car and you're not putting your foot on the gas. You know, you're not changing into the next gear. It's not that we, I'm not saying that we should feel under condemnation. To the contrary, what I'm saying here is that, that when we step forward in faith and when we truly represent and when we, when we, you know, you go and talk to a person that needs a healing need, it's not just by his stripes we are healed, it is by his stripes we are healed. And it's not even the way you say the words. It's the intent of heart. It is why you say the words and the belief that is connected to those words. You know, it's um, the scary part about that one verse is be ye doers of the word and here is not only deceiving your own selves. The scary part of that verse is that it can creep up on you that you've just become a person married to tradition. You've just become a person married to, to the routine of life. You're turning up on up here, it's a cold day, Netflix is running hot, you've got a good you've got good Wi-Fi in the house, you can binge, and you reluctantly turn up here. See, there shouldn't be reluctance. God loves a cheerful giver. God has called us to his purpose. He's called us to step out and, and, and reach out and show people true, genuine worship. People who know. People who can pray in tongues. People who can build themselves up in the most holy faith. That's who we should be. Okay, just uh, James 2, we'll go over the page. And verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one 
of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, which doth it profit. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yes, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Wonderful words. Thou believest that there is one God, thou believest well. Wow, even the devils believed. Woo! See, this is the thing, you know, Pastor Lloyd used to say, yeah, believe means to, you know, do, it's a verb, you know, all that sort of thing, and tremble. And, but wilt thou not know, O vain, that faith without works is dead? And was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac? He had to put his faith on the line. Seest that thou hast, sorry, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by his works was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And I say again, and I've said it already, is the Lord your friend? Or is he just an acquaintance? You know, we often say it, and, and I'm not bagging anybody for saying it. We often say, oh, the Lord's always there when I need him in our testimony. Well, if you're really smoking with the Holy Spirit, you know you need the Lord 24-7 because he's your bestie. He's your friend. He's not just the fallback guy when you get crook or when you're having a bad hair day or when life's not good and you're feeling a bit blue. The Lord is your bestie. He's your friend at all times. And therein lies the tradition, the tr transition into what's next. John 4, 21. No, we'll skip that. Ephesians 1. Pastor Jeff's running his big clock, I think. With the green letters on it. Ephesians 1. The, the God... Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Now, this is a prayer from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. May give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body and the fullness of him that filleth all in all. See, what we've got there is an overview within the Apostle Paul's prayer of the majesty and the glory and the bigness of God. Yet sometimes in our routines, he's just a sentence. And it just doesn't work that way. This is the biggest picture ever. And it's been put into our hearts. We'll go to 1 John 1. Just looking at that picture there and he's got the, uh, you know, the Bible or that book is on, on fire there. Just think about this. This is uh, verse 1 of uh, John, 1 John 1. That which is from the beginning, which ye have heard, which ye have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and we bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, think about that. Yes, we are here fellowshipping with each other. 
And the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. But if you want to just think about this, when you've got a, several hundred people here, we are all communing and fellowshipping through the dispenser of the Holy Spirit. And this is the transition from words to knowledge and wisdom and revelation and understanding. That this is just a, this is just a, a level to it. But the level to it that matters most and as we've said many times from this platform, the Lord's not coming back for the Revival Centre's church. He's coming back for you and he's coming back for those that get it and have allowed the Holy Spirit to transition in their lives. We'll just uh, go over to finish at Hebrews 4. verse 11 and 12 verse yeah okay let us labor therefore that's interesting this is talking to spirit-filled people this is talking to people that have received the holy spirit and are supposedly walking in the spirit and 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 they recognize who they are but there, there, there's this sort of conundrum here. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Because coming to know the Lord through the baptism of the Holy Spirit and coming out in that wonderful tongue is just the beginning of your transition and understanding what it's about. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man falls under the same example of unbelief. And I've said this before. If you lie dormant, you can become a spirit-filled unbeliever. I know it's a, it's, a, it's a mixture of concepts there, but unless you're full of faith and hope and understanding and prayer and reach and reaching out to those around you, you can become dormant. You can become where the words on the page are just words. And you can go in and... And you pray for someone in hospital and, and, and you're saying it because you say it because it's right to say it, but it's not mixed with faith. And what I'm saying here is, let's step up a level. For the word of God, that's the logos. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And the reason those words are in that verse, it's, it's an explanation of the level that the Holy Spirit operates at. It works subatomic. I don't even know what that is, but anyway. It works on your soul, in your soul, which is a level that you and I barely even understand. In fact, no one understands it, really. It goes here. Even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, our intent is vital to meeting the Lord in the air. Our intent now should not just be, I want to meet the Lord in the air. Our intent now should be, I want to represent the Holy Spirit to everyone I can influence. I, and the other part of our intent should be, I want to know God more. I want to be his friend. I want to understand what makes God tick because he understands what makes me tick. And so when we read that verse there, and, and, and it's, it's, it's almost scary at the level that that verse is operating at. We can barely understand, but we are given wonderful guides. We're given tools where we can transit beyond the words. And all I want to say just to conclude today, don't let your spirit-filled walk in the Lord be relegated to a bunch of cliches or a bunch of statements 
that millions of people misquote, misunderstand, misrepresent. You know, when Jesus met the woman at the well, as it's uh, in John 4, he spoke of something quite extraordinary. True worshippers. God is a spirit and they must worship in spirit and in truth. But this, this idea of true worshippers, it, 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 it doesn't relegate you to over there. It really should pedestalize how you think of yourself. You've been made to be a true worshipper. A believer is just a person, in a sense, that, that's full of ideas. A true worshipper is a person who knows. Knows who they are. Understands who they are. Prays in the Spirit and represents the Lord. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, and you've...